And we are back. It is such a pleasure once again, as always, to be with Melanie Phillips. Hello, Melanie. Hello, Abby. It's been a while, hasn't it? It has been a while. I understand you are an extremely busy woman lately. Oh, I don't know what day it is, what continent I'm in, quite frankly. I've just come back from America and Britain, and I'm about to go to Britain and America. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, I... I hope one person at a time, people are listening and being impacted by your insights. And for those of you who are not able to enjoy Melanie in person, well, here we are online, live on Facebook and Twitter. So uh, can I bring up the, the conference you were just at? For sure, yes. Um, I was at a very imp interesting and important conference on Jews and conservatism uh, run by the Tikva Fund. Um, it's the second year that it's been run, um, and it was run uh, in New York. And you might think a conference about Jewish conservatism in New York right. wouldn't draw very much attention, wouldn't draw very much support. After right. all, you know, New Yorkers, New York Jews overwhelmingly are Democrat. Right. Um, last year, the first year the conference was held, uh, they had a apparently around, sorry, uh, they had around 300 people attending. Okay. This year, they had 800 people attending. Wow. And a further 200 uh, who were desperate to attend, were on the waiting list, some of whom were reportedly play, uh, offering to pay black market prices for tickets. <sighs> Unbelievable. So that tells you something. I mean, it's not clear to me whether anyone's being converted uh, politically, but it's clear to me that among people who are conservatively minded, who have been told for years by the prevailing culture, including the Jews in the prevailing culture on the left, that to be conservative is kind of to be uh, to be unspeakable, to have unspeakable views. Um, that uh, all these people um, are desperate, uh, not just to have their views represented and articulated, but they're desperate because they perceive, in my view, absolutely correctly, that the culture that we all uh, um, so uh, revere and want to defend, the culture of freedom, of democracy, of human ri real human rights. Um, and of conscience, of putting others first, and all those good things um, are in the last chance saloon now in the West and in America. And, you know, conservatively minded Jewish people understand very well that some 70% of the American Jewish uh, community uh, votes Democrat and thinks like the left, thinks on the left. And even worse than that, in my view, uh, so many of them have told themselves that these left-wing ideologies they support are Jewish ideas, but they're not. They're actually right. anti-Jewish ideas. They are um, uh, universalist left-wing ideas, um, and consequently they turn into the opposite of what Jewish ideas are, and they stand for basically um, believing lies over truth and victimizer over victim and getting these categories totally confused. And conservatively minded Jews um, uh, understand that. And I think that's what's bringing them out in such great number, uh, so enthusiastically, uh, uh, to try to come along to hear people talk to them um, about these great issues at this conference. Can I ask you about one specific issue that I know is, I'm, I'm referring to refugees, uh, not refugees, migrants, uh, because this is used by many of the Jews on the left in America, and I imagine even in Europe, saying this is this is a Jewish concept. They're putting they're putting our identity as Jews on the line, connecting it to that. Obviously, there must be open borders. Obviously, we have to have we have to have uh, compassion for all these migrants, for the caravan of migrants. Like it's anti-Jewish to to be against it. That, that that's what they're saying. Was that brought up at, at all? And and can you go into it and, and explain? Um, it well, wasn't brought up in the ses specifically in the sessions that I was attending, um, but um, the idea that uh, it is uh, a kind of prerequisite of compassion, no borders to a nation, is ridiculous. There is nothing in Jewish values to say that. On the contrary, um, I mean, Judaism, you know, is constructed around a nation within borders, a nation in a land. Um, uh, it's a terrible mistake to uh, confuse this with the Jewish um, precept that you know you welcome the stranger because you were strangers in Egypt. That has never been taken to mean um, in, in in the Jewish tradition that you should basically dissolve all all notions of the nation as a result. And it's never been taken to mean that um, you dissolve the whole, uh, whole notion of law. 
I mean, the point about the migrant caravan, and it's not a caravan, it's an invasion. It's an organized invasion. I don't know who's organizing it, but someone's organizing it. Someone's paying a lot of money for the, um, the PR materials, for the food, uh, you know, to keep it going. Um, but um, uh, these are not people who wish to immigrate to America. These are people who wish to bust open the laws relating to immigration um, on the basis that they wish to, they, you know, they self, they self evidently wish to storm the border. Um, they wish to negate the rule of law in America when it comes to immigration policy. Now, there's nothing in Jewish law to say that, you know, Jewish, that Judaism supports the wholesale bl Um, and the idea that these people are, you know, refugees is simply ridiculous. By their own definition, they are coming to look for work. Um, we can see that they're overwhelmingly men. Um, this is an organized political thing uh, to, um, I'm not quite sure what the aim is, apart from to storm the border, but maybe the aim is to do rather like what's being done on the Gaza border, to provoke the Trump administration into measures which can be held against the Trump administration. If, 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 if one of these migrants were to be shot dead, for example, having said that, I think that I read today, did I not, that one of the border guards has been shot dead. Um, but anyway, that, really? I, I'm not quite sure about the details of that. Um, Where was this? Uh, in Mexico. Uh, in, 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 in Mexico. Really? Because they're, they're crossing several borders to get to, um, some of them are crossing several borders to get to, 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 to America. Um, so, you know, the idea that to be compassionate, one has to take in everybody who wishes to immigrate into America or Britain or Europe is to say that there should be no national borders whatsoever and anyone can live anywhere. Now, that is a recipe for chaos, uh, quite apart from anything else. And that can't possibly be right under any, any system whatsoever. Right. Wow. All right. And so, so what, what other issues, hot topic issues were brought up there that you can uh, share with us? Um, well, uh, the whole idea of, of the nation was a very uh, important part of the discussion, I think. Um, I mean, I'm particularly interested in that. I mean, the the uh, the, the conference uh, in its in its in its sort of overall materials uh, talks about uh, the need to um, uh, to revivify conservatism in order to revivify American civic values or American mm. civic culture. There is this perception that American civic culture is going down the tubes under the pressure of. Um, identity politics, the rage and hate unleashed by identity politics, the destruction of the traditional family um, as the bedrock of uh, tr the transmission of a culture, and the tr destruction of education right. as the means of transmitting a culture, all those things. Um, and the very idea of the nation, which is behind this uh, onslaught on Western values, the idea of the Western nation being illegitimate because it is fundamentally racist and all the rest of it and aggressive and colonialist. And behind that, the idea of nationalism being bad um, and, uh, you know, this confusion of, with, of nationalism with bigotry. Um, and, you know, nationalism has, has become a very elastic word. It can mean uh, something which is, I think, much more to do with imperialism, the desire to take over other people's countries. And it's been associated with bigotry uh, because basically of Hitler, uh, because it's it was perceived that, you know, um, Nazism was a kind of manifestation of extreme nationalism. Well, in my view, it wasn't, actually. Um, it had nationalist elements, but basically it was imperialism. Hitler thought of himself right. as a reincarnation of the Holy Roman Emperor. He wanted to, you know, he wanted Germany to take over uh, a number of other countries. That's the problem. Um, and nationalism is, as you could say, is another word for patriotism. See, when Donald Trump talks about nationalism... I was going to ask you, just last week, just last week, speech he he's made, being attacked for that. He said, I am a nationalist. And everybody went, oh, you see, he is a fascist after all. He's a Nazi because he's a nationalist. Well, he made it quite clear what he means by nationalism. And it's what I would call patriotism. Right. And what he said he meant by nationalism was that as, you know, as a national leader, he wants to prioritize and privilege the interests of America over the other countries of the world. He thinks it would be quite wrong for him as President of the United States to say, I shouldn't try and privilege my country over other countries in the world. Now, 
by that definition, that's what any national leader should. presumably wants to do or should do. Right. If a national leader says, actually, you know what, I think my country should just take its place in the queue and other countries should come first, I don't think that national leader would last very long. So that's what he's talking about. But of course, being Trump, um, he doesn't pay any attention to the way his words might be interpreted by his enemies. And his enemies duly leap upon this. Um, I'd have interpreted it in, in, in that way. Or maybe he does pay attention, he, doesn't, he well, doesn't care. who knows. But what I do know is that for several decades, the sort of governing ideology on the left generally, not just in America, but in the, right. in the, in the West generally, has been the nation, because of the Holocaust, because of Nazism, the nation is intrinsically bad. The Western nation is intrinsically right. bad. Right. And it must intrinsic, it, because it's intrinsically prejudiced and bigoted and imperialist and it, it, you know, it's intr intrinsically a danger to everybody, um, you have to subsume the nation into transnational institutions uh, such as the European Union, such as the United Nations. Must, must, the, the decisions of the United Nations must, must take precedence over, over, over national decisions and all the rest of it. The international human rights law, which is not human rights at all. It's, 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 it's an artificial set of human rights as, as decided by right. judges. Um, so that's been the governing mantra. And as such, the Western nation can't defend itself. And that's why you have this mantra of open borders mm -hmm. being so necessary, because if the Western nation is rubbish and awful, then it must give way to you know, the brotherhood of man. Well, there is no brotherhood of man. There's just chaos and anarchy. And then what you, have, what you unleash is um, if you don't have the nation uh, bounded by geography, um, able to defend itself as um, a collective in which the people of that nation all push together in one common project, which is basically what a nation is about, bound together by history, tradition, language, um, culture, religion, and all the rest of it. If you don't have that, then you have a situation in which the nation breaks down internally into kind of tribal groupings, which is what identity politics is. Right. And these groupings then fight each other for power and precedence and they must smash all opposition, which is precisely what we have. And you have a situation in which, more globally, if you don't have borders, then you have people um, re, you know, who want to identify with others with whom they share a national culture, reacting against that and uh, subscribing to groupings, some of which are deeply obnoxious, which promise them a return to national groupings. So you have chaos and confusion, which is precisely oh, where we've got to because of this overarching doctrine on the left, which has governed us for, well, I think since the Second World War, um, but with increasing ferocity, right. that the Western nation has to be dissolved in one way or another. And let me ask you this, because something that I've been focusing on, at least in my mind, and trying to get out there, I'd love to hear how this works in, if, if, if you think I'm on target or not, is also how we have been educated to think that we have to avoid, avoid war at all costs. Mm. And diplomacy is the be-all, end-all, no matter how evil or bad or imperialistic a, 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 another nation can be. And I believe it's important, wait a second, humanity is humanity. There are good and there are bad. Sometimes there are bad nations who are out to get others and take over others and kill others. And diplomacy isn't going to stop it. We have to accept, like, no, you have to be able to defend yourself. And we've, the Western world has lost that and has to come back to understand that. Am I... Am I no, that's absolutely right. I mean, we should all try and avoid war wherever possible. I mean, I would have hoped that was a given. Um, but that does not mean that we should not have war as a last resort. And it's even more important to understand, which is something that few now understand, that it's only by the threat of war that you can maintain peace and right. avoid war. Um, and the reason why war has become the big no-no is partly because this idea of the Western nation being rubbish and bad and bigoted and awful, so you can't ever defend the Western nation. You should only go to war in, in support of people who are against the Western nation, almost. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's more than that. It's also the governing ideology on the left. There is no such thing as, tr as objective truth. Everything's a matter of opinion. 
So if everything's a matter of opinion, then everything is negotiable. And there is no such thing as objective truth. There's no such thing as an objective lie. There's no such thing, therefore, objectively speaking, as a victim and victimizer. So therefore it follows, there's no point in going back to first cause. There's no point in saying, well, who started this It's a war? waste of time. Who, who is the aggressor here? Who is the victim? It's a waste of time. What we want to avoid is dead bodies on all sides. So we put victim and victimizer on an even keel together, and we put them in a room together, whether actual or metaphorical, and we make them negotiate and compromise, which means that good must compromise with evil, which means that evil wins. Right. So this is a deeply, deeply immoral and amoral position, which guarantees that the victim can never get justice that you can never have peace with justice in the world, that the victimizer always wins, that the victimizer has all the cards in his hand. I mean, a greater recipe for global mayhem cannot be imagined. Right. And that's what lies behind this mantra that, you know, you don't do conflict anymore, you do conflict resolution. It sounds compromise with, you cannot compromise with genocide. Right. So if you say... that is threatening genocide, then also almost all to some extent to the unconscionable agenda. And you've made that unconscionable agenda much more likely to be realized. You've made war more likely. You've made genocidal war more likely. This is, this is a terrible thing. And yet the left tells itself that the only moral position is to go down the road of conflict resolution, negotiated compromise, peace processes. That's the way you In the world. Right, and I add, I add to that. It's also the enabling of further Muslims that could have been stopped if we just finally realized see, it's, it's not a. It's mind twisting because the left has not just um, uh, um, latched on. To poses it is by definition bad, evil, right. a warmonger, a zealot, and so if you say. Uh, if you make the argument that I'm making, right. you are accused of being right. the warm -up. Language has been hijacked. Uh, reality has been inverted. Um, terms have come to mean, to be directed at conservatively minded Jews, uh, that you know this has got to be stopped somehow. That you know we have to we have to somehow take back our culture from this lunacy. Wow. Okay, well, I understand this conference was in New York, you mentioned, and you were there when the Pittsburgh Synagogue Massacre took place. What are your thoughts on being there and the atmosphere afterwards? What, what, what do you have to share with us on, well, on anti-Semitism? That's the big trigger word right now in America, anti-Semitism. Yes, yes. Well, it took place, of course, on Shabbat, and um, uh, the word somehow filtered through to um, a Shabbat. I mean, mm. the particular synagogue where I was... Uh, there are many synagogues which are not guarded, um, and so there. And this is very, very strange because there have been attacks on Jews in the past, and you would think they'd be, you know, they would be, uh, they they would have been. is reprehensible in many respects. Uh, ...could possibly be held to have inspired anti-Semitism, let alone violence. He's the most philo-Semitic president that probably America has ever had. He made uh, his remarks in the immediate aftermath of this atrocity went further than I think any American president Correct. has ever done or would ever go in not just denouncing anti-Semitism, but saying, in terms, I will destroy the people who wish to destroy the Jewish people. Right. That's pretty amazing stuff. But beyond that, the idea that um, his brand of nationalism has inspired uh, what are called the far right, the white supremacists, uh, Ku Klux Klan types, um, rabid anti-Semites, um, is itself 
a kind of derangement. And it shows that people who say this have no idea what anti-Semitism is and in effect are committing themselves a kind of anti-Semitism or Nazism denial. Because anti-Semitism doesn't come out of a political uh, ideology. It's not inspired by nationalism or imperialism or any other ism. It is found across ideologies, across politics, across religions, across cultures, across centuries. And so, you know, it's a form of mental illness. It's a form of derangement. It's a paranoia. Anti-Semitism, it is fundamentally exterminatory. At the base of it, it wishes to destroy the Jewish people. Why? Because the Jewish people are held uniquely to be a cosmic evil. That is in itself crazy and is not inspired by any political ideology whatsoever. The idea that you know the German Nazis were anti-Semites because it came from German nationalism is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, and so this, this, the, the idea that anyone could have inspired this person right. to do this, and the idea that the, the, the you know, that the, okay, so he, it, it said he, he subscribes to far-right ideology. Right, okay. Now, far-right ideology, I don't think Mr. Trump can be accused of inspiring that. Why? Because he says that he, 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 he privileges America over everybody else. So it's said that he is uh, inspiring, uh, the, the, the evidence that he's inspiring uh, white supremacists is that they support him. Well, these people, I mean, this, this is first of all to give those people the, the dignity of rational thinking. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, it's to ignore the fact that um, part of what these people believe is what I would call nationalism, but they, in that they, they, they want you know, America to reassert itself as a nation. But what they mean by that is a racially pure nation. Nothing Mr. Trump has ever said has, uh, could possibly be held to suggest racial purity. They don't get that right. from him. They get that from themselves. themselves. Um, it is a derangement of themselves. And the, mm. the last thing to say about this is that the idea that anti-Semitism and uh, far-right white supremacism and all that um, are on the increase because of President Trump is, to put it mildly, ahistorical. I mean, anti-Semitism uh, you know, in America has a long history, and the anti-Semitism on the far right uh, you could trace back a long time, but you can certainly trace it back to the 1920s, 1930s, when the Ku Klux Klan, for various reasons, adopted anti-Semitism in addition to its anti-black uh, stuff. And, uh, and it wasn't just the Ku Klux Klan. You had major re regular um, communities where no Jews allowed into communities and into, into, into uh, clubs. This is also and true. This is also true. And to and, schools. And the far right, you know, the, the far right militias uh, which have plagued America um, uh, got going, I believe, I'm, what I'm reading, in the 1990s. I mean, again, again, you can trace them back further, but certainly as a kind of movement that began to really right. threaten America and produce you know, far-right terrorism, uh, it really got going in the 1990s. And I was just reading a piece uh, uh, on Tablet, I think it was, uh, which says, um, uh, in 1999, uh, there were several attacks on Jewish targets by white supremacists. Uh, in September of 1999, this piece says, the New York Times ran a headline, Synagogues Responding to Violence Add Security as High Holy Days mm -hmm. Near. The article described a year of high-profile anti-Semitic violence. That year, the FBI recorded 1,289 reported anti-Semitic incidents, the highest number on record before in 2017. So... You know, this, this thing hasn't suddenly come out of the woodwork because of President Trump. Right. It's been building for a long time. And my personal view, and this is my last, last point, yes. and I wrote this in my blog on melaniephillips.com, or I wrote it in a piece of the Times of London, I can't quite remember which piece I've written where, but anyway, is that anti-Semitism um, is an absolute marker of and comes out with increased ferocity when a culture is in trouble. Mm -hmm. The West is in trouble for all the reasons that you and I have discussed today right. and on previous occasions. It doesn't know what it is anymore. It doesn't know what it should be. It, 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 it denies its own virtue. It describes itself in terms which are entirely odious. It wishes to destroy itself. It is fragmenting. It is fragmenting. And when you have a culture in trouble, 
then you have anti-Semitism. You don't have a culture in trouble when a nation is proud of itself. In other words, a leader which says, I'm going to make this nation proud of itself again, is the last leader who will actually inspire real anti-Semitism. That comes out when a leader says, you know what, our culture is rubbish. And then you find the people turning on the Jews for all kinds of reasons. Right. So um, uh, this is a fundamental misreading. It is fundamentally ignorant to blame Trump for the rise of neo-Nazism and anti-Semitism. And it is fundamentally disgusting. And the most tragic thing of all, the most tragic thing of all, is the way in which Jews are now fighting other Jews on the left. Uh, or the Jews on the left are now blaming and holding responsible Jews who, don't su who, who supported President Trump as being somehow responsible for this. That is beyond obscene to me. That is, that is beyond obscene. It's beyond disgusting. It's a Jewish tragedy. And that kind of disgusting, tragic self-hate is going to, you know, that, that threatens to destroy the Jewish community much more than anti-Semitism will ever do. Right. And, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that point and just um, uh, bring up a fact, follow, follow up with a question, because you were talking about how, how anti-Semitism exists, has always existed, and, and, and it's, no, it's no rational thought process to it. There are people who are anti-Semitic because they say George Soros is a Jew, right? So he's a leftist, so then you have people on the right who hate that because the Jewish power on the left. But then you have those leftists who complain about the all-powerful Jewish Israel lobby who run governments of the world and American governments. That's coming from the left. Oh, yeah, you have the one saying, oh, we hate Jews because they're communists. And you have, no, they run all the banks. Well, decide. And, and it's not. It, no one, everyone can pick and choose for there their own are, reason. The deranged anti-Jewish conspiracy theory that the Jews are a conspiracy to subvert the world in their own, in their own interests, we are finding and have found for years on both left and right. The left and the right march as one on this. Um, and the, po you know, the point about George Soros, I mean, this is another discussion, uh, uh, but the idea that you can't criticize somebody because he's a Jew, and that if you do so, it must be anti-Semitic, I mean, that is just ridiculous. Um, uh, there are ample grounds to criticize George Soros. Um, uh, you don't have to be an anti-Semite to do so. Do anti-Semites criticize him or hold him responsible for what he does because he's a Jew and use him to, f to furnish their anti-Jewish conspiracy theories? Most certainly they do. On the very far right, the Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacists, whoever they are, they use him, but they use all kinds of other Jews as well in that respect because they will use any Jew in public life um, uh, uh, to, f to, to, to serve that purpose. Uh, but it, th does that mean that therefore one can't criticize anyone uh, who, because he happens to be a Jew, that's, that's completely ridiculous. And that's kind of what we're being told, that you know, certain people like George Soros must be beyond criticism because they're Jewish. Well, where did that come from? Uh, I, I, you know, that's, 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 that's a, a hysterical reaction the other way, except that it's, having said that, it's not actually hysterical because you see George Soros is being used as kind of human shield by the left. Because mm. um, by saying, you know, here is George Soros, he has been elevated into this, uh, you know, he, he is, he is, he is, he is, no, he is the yeah. symbol of far right Jewish conspiracy theory. Because that's what Jewish conspiracy theory is. It's far right. In other words, they get off scot free. Right. Most Jewish conspiracy theory is coming from the left. Most of it. I mean, it's only been going on for years. I mean, I, you know, Iraq War. In Britain, it was being said by the left, and it's, it still is, that it was you know, the result of a conspiracy, a malign conspiracy between uh, Jerusalem and the neocons, the Jewish neocons of Washington, to subvert the foreign policy of America uh, in the interest of Israel and putting everybody else at risk. And it was a, you know, common, a common uh, 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 thing that was being said, and it's been said ever since, in one form or another. So this idea that you know Jewish conspiracy theory is 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 a is a, is, a, is something that's only manufactured on the far right and is their signature. Um, it is true, it is their signature, uh, but it's also the signature on the far on the far left and not so far left. Right. Uh, one of the points I've I've been making lately, and I've been saying this for a while. I was saying I was saying this even before Trump was elected. This is during the Obama presidency, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, and then we can go on to the to the last topic. I said the, the basic. T I said yes. There's anti-Semitism on both right and left. The problem is, 
On the right, they are shunned, tarred and feathered by mainstream conservative camp. But on the left, anti-Semitism has been mainstreamed. You have the Farrakhans, you have the Keith Ellisons, you have the Linda Sarsours, who they, they are they are the poster children of not well not, not necessarily was Farrakhan, but they're not there is there's silence with their anti-Semitic stances and sayings and the college campus growth. So that's how I've been saying there's a difference between the two, even though, yes, they, it exists on both sides. Any yeah. insight into that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely correct. And that's the most terrible thing about it, that um, uh, uh, all uh, uh, decent people will shun um, the anti-Semitism on the, on, on the, on the, on the far right. Um, but um, they ignore or even support what is anti the anti-Semitism on, on, the, on the left. And that has, as you say, it has uh, mainstreamed it. Um, and I think it's not just mainstreamed it, but it has emboldened the far right as well. Mm, right. Because, you know, if everyone's an anti-Semite, then way, hey, says the far right. We right. can jump in as well. And also, the far right have been talked up. My goodness, have they been talked up by the left. Right. They've had publicity to die for. Uh, other people are going to die for it. But they've had publicity to die for from the left. I mean, these are, you know, a, bu a small bunch of of crazed, kooky individuals, basically. The left runs our culture. Um, you know, what the left says matters. Um, these people don't matter politically. They can do violence, they can do harm, they can kill people, but they don't matter politically in the way that the left does. But my goodness, what a shot in the arm they've had from the left constantly talking, talking them up in this way. Wow. Okay, yeah, listen, unfortunately, I wish I could say this is going to be the last... No more anti-Semitism. We're not going to have to... We're not going to have to talk about this anymore, but I, uh, it's, 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 it's not going away, unfortunately. All right, last topic. This has been an issue that you've been on top of since the beginning. Brexit. Oh. What is the latest with <laughs> Britain and Brexit? Is it happening, Melody? According to what oh. you said, is it happening? I really can't bear it. I mean, I you know I feel the increasing need to pull the duvet over my head and put oh. plugs in my ears. Um, it's playing out exactly as I feared. As you feared. At the very very last minute, you know, a deal will be done. Those words fill me with absolute horror because. There is no deal that can be done with the, Un the European Union that will be in Britain's interests. Mm. The only deal that will be in Britain's interests is no deal. And Britain has told itself that anything is better than no deal. And that if you think that no deal is better than a bad deal, then you are a crazed Brexiteer. So I'm in the latter category because um, the European Union deal means keeping Britain to some extent bound by the European Union. Um, that's what it's all about. Um, they have certain red lines, and for them their red lines were always real red lines. Right. Uh, they could not allow Britain to leave the customs union. Why? Because Britain outside the customs union would take the EU to the cleaners economically. They can't allow it. They cannot allow competition. They must keep Britain tied. Um, and uh, that is their red line, and all credit to them, they've pursued their, they've held to their red line. So then we had this uh, straw man, or straw weapon perhaps, of the Irish border. I won't bore you with the okay. arcane details of the okay. Irish border, but suffice it to say that in my view, it was confected as a roadblock to a deal. But it was never a roadblock. There are a number of ways in which it could be finessed. Lo and behold, just as I, just as I, I may have even said it to you, but I certainly thought it, the, the fear in my mind was at the very last minute, after a great bit of shouting and screaming, that the whole thing is going to go pear-shaped, it's going to go bad because of the Irish border, we can't get a deal because of the Irish border, the Irish border, the Irish border, the Irish border. We've heard nothing but the Irish border for months. Quite obvious to me why this was being talked up. In order to, at the very last minute, the European Union negotiators can say, you know what? We'll give you a concession on the Irish border. Mm, but everything else. But you must be in the customs union as a result. And that's exactly what is happening. According to the Sunday Times, they have a leak of the final deal, which Mrs. May is going to present as her triumph. Her triumph. She's achieved a deal 
we've solved the Irish border problem. It was so easy to solve the Irish border problem, apparently. Because they gave up on Because everything. it comes with a compromise, stay in the customs union. Why couldn't they solve the Irish border problem without the compromise? No reason at all. In other words, the Irish border problem was always a fiction. It was never a problem. It's been hyped up in order to get what appears to be a great concession by the European mm. Union and then the deal. And then Mrs. the fear is that Mrs. May will then come to the British Parliament and say, take it or leave it. Either we have this or we have no deal. And we all know that no deal is off the cliff. C catastrophic results. Now, a no deal is not good. Specifically, particularly because, unforgivably, it would appear the British government did not prepare for no deal. I mean, this is like, how could they possibly not have prepared for all eventuality? Answer, because... It was a, always a weapon that no deal will be the end of the world. So they had to make it the end of the world. Mm. So now the British Conservative Party will have to make a decision. The Brexiteers will have to make a decision. They have, they have so far hedged their bets. They've, they've, they've stuck with Mrs May despite all their fears because they're too frightened to get rid of her. They're too frightened because they think it might provoke a general election and then Jeremy Corbyn might come in. They're too frightened because they don't actually have a candidate that they can all agree on. They're all busy fighting each other. They're basically pathetic. The future of the country is at stake. And in my view, and I've said this many times, the Brexit uh, vote, the idea that Britain will leave the European Union is, in my view, the last chance that Britain has to become Britain again, to become a great country that not only uh, makes tremendous progress economically, freed of the European Union ties, but also finds itself as a nation again. And then much of all the stuff we've been talking about becomes much more easy to manage and, in fact, goes away because everyone then has to pull together as a nation. Last chance for that to happen. Unless, of course, the European Union itself collapses, which is also a possibility. But put that aside, this is the last chance. And the idea that it might now be slipping through uh, Britain's fingers um, in a way that was entirely predictable to all people who believed that Brexit actually meant leaving the European Union, and you couldn't finesse that, the idea that that might be happening is a terrible thing. Wow. And it will produce a reaction. Um, I don't know quite what form the reaction will be. It's Britain. Britain doesn't do extremes. It doesn't do violence. It does stoicism, but it does terminal cynicism as well. And it could mean that Britain's um, Brexit voting public will just completely lose faith in its governing class, completely. And why shouldn't it? If Britain remains in the European Union, Britain, I mean, it's, it's hardly worth even bothering about Britain's parliament anymore. Uh, uh, because it will simply be a regional government of the European Union Empire. Mm. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. The next few days, the next few weeks will be absolutely critical because uh, this is the crunch. Le crunch has arrived um, and very uh, angst making it is. Wow. Melanie, it is a pleasure once again. Missed having these uh, talks with you to hear your insight, but thank you so much for, for coming back. And uh, it should be a, a safe week. And everybody, if you are not, if you are not yet directly receiving Melanie's updates as they come out, go to MelaniePhillips.com, sign up for her newsletter, get them right when it comes out. Very, very important insight. I helps me tremendously. It will help, I imagine, it will help you as well. And thank you once again, Melanie. Thank you, Avi, and my apologies to everybody out there for my interrupted posts at the moment, but uh, all this travelling, I'm afraid, is taking quite a heavy toll on, the, on my uh, routines. But thank you all so much for watching and listening again. Take care, everyone.